today's message is number 10 in our series on heaven and hell. Somebody asked me when I'm going to teach more on hell, and I said, don't worry, I will. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> Each of these messages may deal with a different aspect uh, or dimension, but the series is designed to better help us understand certain things about our absolute certain future destiny. Um, today I'm going to take you back to Matthew's Gospel to look again at another parabolic method in which our Lord himself gives us more insight into this subject. So if you want to turn to Matthew 13 once more. And um, what I like about this and other didactic gems that come out of the Lord's teaching, it's really designed if we really, really are going to read and try and dig a little bit, it's designed to open our eyes. And, you know, sometimes I think we, we go through these familiar passages and we're not really peeling out the most, we're not gleaning the most for ourselves. So I hope today we'll do that. Um, there's a couple of interesting things, but let me read the passage first. So we are in Matthew 13, and we're going to be reading two sections, but starting at verse 24. And something that you probably will hear me either teach on or I will address this either in a message or on festival um, is about the subject in Matthew's uh, gospel of the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. And the reason why this is kind of an important place to study, I'm not going to do it now, but I'll just put it out there, is if you recall in the beginning, we have the forerunner to Christ telling people, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then when Jesus starts his ministry, that is the message he begins to preach. And so we have two dynamics. We have and I will I'll expound on this at another time, but the kingdom of heaven, that is essentially the appearing of which, which begins with, for our conversation, for our discussion with Christ. So there is the kingdom of heaven that is being referred to in the now, as the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, versus the kingdom of heaven, which will also represent the culmination of this present age. There are two dynamics going on. So I, I just put that in there. I will expound on that at a later time. But the kingdom of heaven, verse 24 in uh, Matthew 13, is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. While men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. When the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also, the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence hath, then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest and in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, this is rather interesting because how, um, I'm going to say, however, this was collated, and I'm not quite sure that the flow goes from one verse to the next. We've got the wheat and the tares, then you've got the parable of the mustard seed, the leaven. And then jump with me to verse 34, because it says, All these things Jesus spake unto the multitudes in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. Now this is what's interesting is they came to him and asked specifically 
Can you explain this to us? Now, there's a lot of other parables in here that they don't come to him and they don't ask, but this particular one they ask him to explain. So, verse 37, he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. Now, let's do something that kind of simplifies this. Let's go back to verse 24 for a second. Kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed a good seed, sowed good seed in his field. So, good seed, the one who is sowing, who is sowing. Good seed, son of man. And that title, of course, is, is only being used uh, with, I should put here, the definite article of Christ. The field is the world. And forgive me if I go through this, it seems very simple, it is, but there's something that a lot of us read by. Field, the world. So let's look back here when it says good seed in his field. It's his field, by the way, right? His, his, his field. Next, we have the good seed. And this is, this is that subtle thing. I think a lot of people confuse this because if you think seed, sower, seed is the word, but it says here, the good seed are the children of the kingdom. Good seed, children, of kingdom, all right? And the tares are the children of the wicked one, wicked one. Okay, then we have the enemy that sow them is the devil. So it's all very, it seems very simple. And the harvest is the end of the world, the reapers are the angels. It's all explained. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels. They shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, why is this so to me? so marvelous that this is included for us? Well, the first thing is, it's not something that we would readily go and investigate because it seems rather straightforward, except kind of interesting. The wheat and the tares, he says, no, don't, don't go and try to take the, remove the tares. Let them stay there. Let them grow together. The question would be, anybody who's reading this parable would say, well, how will the reapers know? How will the angels, how will the reapers know? How will they distinguish? Because there's, there, there's information here that's not given unless you go to look. Uh, how will they distinguish what is wheat and what is tares? And I say, how will they distinguish this? Because in the early stages of growth, the wheat and the tares look exactly the same. It's only in their later stages of uh, maturation that you find that the wheat begins to slightly bow a little bit back towards the ground. That is because the head of the wheat contains, and we're going to call it for the purpose of my uh, exposition, the head of the wheat contains fruit. The darnel or the tares, the weeds, they will keep growing straight. What's in their head or the head of the, the tares will be little seeds, but there is no fruit. And if one would try to eat it, it's bitter and probably could even be, some say, poisonous. Who knows? So what's interesting is it's only in the maturation that one could be able to see the difference between the wheat, which actually is bent back slightly towards the earth, versus the tares that straight up. And when I was trying to find imagery that I could explain this and make a very salient point, it's as though we, those of us who look to Christ, those of us who will produce fruit, whether that's like the parable that I said, some uh, hundredfold, 60 or 30, but those of us who will bring forth fruit will probably, in our lifetime, experience what I've called the humbling uh, breaking that basically brings us to our knees, brings us to cry out to God, brings us to that kind of low, if you will, bent down, and I, I'm going to stretch this all the way and say this is why if you come back to the beginning of Matthew's gospel and it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. These concepts of being broken, being 
humbled by God versus the weeds or the tares that keep growing straight. They keep growing upwards. They are full of, essentially the imagery is full of pride. They will not bow. They will not be broken. And so it's kind of interesting to me that if you look at this, because that was my question, how would they know? Well, again, if you comb back in the Bible, you know, there's passages that are sometimes taken out of context that people like to use, like, you shall know them by their fruits, right? And that gives license to people somehow to say, well, I'm going to be your fruit inspector. That's not what is intended or implied. Essentially, here we have the depiction, but I love the fact that he says, let them both grow together. So let's talk about this for a minute because this is another level of the parable of the sower kind of we'll say it's getting sifted down. Each one of these might get sifted down a little bit more. Here I have something that you know, people might go, ooh, that's a terrible thought, but I'm going to put it out there because it's not explained to us. It doesn't elaborate. It just says wheat and tares grow together until the end or the consummation of the age, and then the reapers will go. And it says first, by the way, first gather ye together first the tares. So there is a decisive order to all things. But until that time, the wheat and the tares will be together. And until the point of maturation or completion, it's hard to distinguish or know the difference between the two. Don't think you can just by this parable say, oh, I could know. It's, it's really talking about a, a period of time that a body collective and then at the end of the age is separated. Now, why is this important? Because you could read this and immediately your mind could go to the tares are the tares are people out there, but in fact the tares could be people in here too. This is what's important. We tend to sometimes read these things and make them essentially how we want them to be read. But I, I urge you, I encourage you to kind of give two meanings to this parable regarding the tares. One of them is what I referenced last week in the type of um, soil when I said those that are shallow, because there are shallow Christians. I want you to think of this. Uh, one of the old timies, and I think it might have been either um, J.C. Riley or I'm not 100% sure who said this when they said, well, it's entirely possible that God could turn the tares into wheat. Now listen, God's sovereign. He can do what he wants, but sorry, friend, that's not what the parable reads as. The parable reads that the tares are the tares and the wheat is the wheat, period, okay? Sometimes we have this tendency. Preachers do it. Parishioners do it. We want to kind of make it read the way we'd like it to read, but the reality is when it's discussing the tares, let's step back here and say that if the wheat and the tares are growing together, we could say this applies to both wheat and tares within the church and also wheat that is out because we are living in the world. We're not of the world, but living in the world, living amongst tares in the world. So you've got two possible implications, and it's important we make both apply. Now, somebody might say, well, do you mean to tell me that there could be tares in the church? Absolutely. And now here comes the fun part. The fun part is that, you know, I think when you've been in the ministry long enough, you get to see things, and I don't make them the absolute because they, they're experiences or things I've seen that could still fall in the category of subjective understanding, but I have seen enough to see people who have come, and they have been tears. And now I'll just put it out bluntly. There is no way if somebody really understands, and I say really, really understands, the state you are in when Jesus finds you, if you understand that, there's no way that you would ever want to be a defector out of his hand. There is no way that you would say, and I'm, I'm sorry if I offend people right now, but I'm just going to say it. So having a conversation with somebody who said, how could somebody... You know, you hear in the news a lot of people who convert to another faith. They were Christians. They convert because they want to get married to somebody who's not of their faith. And the, the, the discussion is how can somebody leave the faith of Christ? And once, if you've come to know who Christ is and what he's done and who he is, how could you 
go and say, well, I, I now want to be over here and I want to believe this. That means you probably didn't have a clear understanding, if you were a Christian, of who Jesus Christ was and is to easily turn your back and follow something else, which I'm sorry to say I'm not elitist, I'm not some supremacist, but in understanding comparatively, there is no other faith preached or proclaimed that offers the answers to most of our questions. Why am I here? What's my purpose? Will there be something more? I mean, I could keep going, but I don't want to bore you. So, it's important to understand that terrors can be in the church. Now, let me give you a biblical example of terrors in the church. Was or were Annas and Ananias and Sapphira part of the church? Yeah. And a little louder, were they part of the church? Yeah. Okay. And it seems to me pretty clear that the teaching was made abundantly clear to all who came in that first, um, I think it's the fourth and fifth chapter of the book of Acts, that essentially everybody who heard the message, they weren't being told anything else except those who understood. They were bringing their offering, their goods, laying at the feet of the apostles because it was a community of, we'll call them koinonia, of givers. They, they collected everything, they distributed everything. So Annas and Ananias and Sapphira come, come across to me as tares in the church. They had heard the instructions, they had heard the teaching, but chose to do otherwise. When it came time for them to participate in essentially laying up what others had done, which is they had a piece of property sold the money and held back a part of it when essentially they were going to give it all, but they held back a part, lied to God. There's a picture of terrorists in the church. So don't make the mistake of thinking, well, this is here's us and here's the world. There will be people who will come into the church, sit every Sunday. This is the thing that grieves me to the core. If, I, if there was any way that I could convince you, and I can't, because just my words, and unless you... Unless you and I are on the same page with the mind of Christ, what I say could just be, it doesn't matter to you. It has no impact. But this is what grieves me. People that come into the church with little or no understanding that this is not a game. This is not some, you know, well, if I have time, I'll go. I think I'll go to church this Sunday, but I you know, haven't been in six months. It becomes, or the people that come to the church, any church, but it's not taken wholeheartedly. And i got to tell you this. There's a reason why it's not taken wholeheartedly most of the time. Starts with the preacher. Starts with the minister. If the church has become a catering to the desires of people who come in because they want this. They desire that. We want our, the church menu of things that we will offer here to please the masses. You're no longer going to church. You notice, I've never, I've never asked anybody here to approve of something I deliver to you. There's only one that I'm going to ask for approval, and that's God. I'm not looking for people to say, I, I, I want this subject, even though we've put out cards and we said, what are you interested in? But that's not going to influence my preaching. I'm just putting a pulse out there to find out, are people actually interested in the Bible, or are they interested in something else? But to start and try and please the masses, people want to hear about, uh, I told you, uh, this is my comedy. Uh, several years back, I remember turning on the TV. It was one of those Christian stations. And I, I sat and watched several programs as they came on. One program was a guy selling vitamins. Um, it was, you know, pastor so-and-so of church so-and-so. And, of course, his thing was, well, God's people need to be healthy, so take these vitamins. Now, listen, God's people need to be healthy, and vitamins aren't bad for you, but I'm supposed to stand here and tell you about the great physician, not about the great bottle that you can take. <laughs> the great physician, whom we read about in this book, then there was the lady that wanted to tell people about her, how God had helped pay for her breast implants. She's a minister and spent several years producing 
exercise, video, everything else but what people need. I want you to think about that. Everything else but. So how can anybody come to know God, love God, understand what God wants of you if it's everything but? And this is why terrors can also be in the pulpit. Does that shock you? Terrors can also be in the pulpit. Terrors are not just in the pews. There are people with, from the beginning, their motivation is, Let's see how much money we can make. Let's see how many fools are out there. Let's see how many people we can deceive. All we have to do is say really good words that, are, that feel good, that make you either more greedy or more whatever, Let's, whatever the descriptive is. So tears can be in the pulpit too. Do not be deceived. As Paul says in Galatians, God is not mocked. And I think a lot of times people, they just, they don't understand tears can be a part of any. They can be anywhere. Now, they grow together. So let's kind of go down the pathway here. They they grow together until harvest time. So let's talk about this, this interesting concept here. The instructions, gather you together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Does that sound by any chance like Jesus is saying that the wheat and tares will grow together and then the tares will be plucked up and removed and the bundles to burn them. Does that sound like people are going to go to a temporary place to uh, get a little warm? (laughs) Does it sound like that to you? It doesn't sound like that to me. And what's disturbing is, again, if we're reading what Jesus said, there's, it's, a, it's, it's pretty direct. These that have been planted by the evil one that are the children of the wicked one. So we're not talking, let's get out of poetry or parable and let's talk about humanity and the destiny of humankind. Once more, reduced down to two camps. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Now, there are abundant people who teach universalism. All will be saved. Does this sound like all will be saved? Thank you. Because I'm only interested in what the book says. If I find something different in the book that that shows me otherwise, I'm going to say it, even if it goes contrary to what I've spent 25 years in my own search, believing, but I don't read that here. And then, if I'm going to keep elaborating on this, but gather the wheat into my barn. The wheat is not gathered and put into some remote place, but I want you to see that personal pronoun, my barn, mine, God. It belongs to me. I've told you before that word for barn is where we get our word for apothecary, shopkeeper, one who stores or the storehouse, if you will. So if you think about it, people are constantly talking about bringing the tithe to the storehouse, but essentially we become that to God. We are God's precious fruit, if you will, the thing that we bear to him. And it says, into my barn. So we definitely see a few things that are crystal clear. One of them is the decisiveness. So somebody might say, is there some ambiguity here? And I would say not in the slightest. That's number one. Number two is, when we talk about this, there is a decisive end for the tares. Let's not engage in wishful thinking, as I just mentioned, universalism universalism that preaches all will be saved. Here, the children of the wicked one are gathered together and burnt up. Now, if you keep reading, when I got into that... um, Second part there, in the verses 40, 41, 42 forward, uh, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, does it say, and then the people will then go off and be in heaven? Nope. So as they're burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels. They shall gather out of his kingdom. It's his. His barn, his kingdom belongs to him. All the things that offend and then which do iniquity. 
and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And we're going to see this repeatedly. Cast into outer darkness, wailing and gnashing of teeth. There's always a description of sorrow, doom. And if you remember, I started out in this series referring to the passage out of Luke that talks about um, Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham. And the reason why I started there is because it almost sets the template for everything else that you read to show you two types of people, two places. I know I've been repeating this for years, but there are only two types of people. When you sift it all down, God is not looking at your skin color. He doesn't care about your gender. He doesn't care about how much or how little you have. What he does care about, will you trust him? And will you trust him implicitly with no buts, ifs, or whatever's attached? You come to him. You start to learn about him, and then we have what is absolutely clear, a divisive situation at the end of time, which is why when you go and you read the rest of Scripture that talks about what will happen at the consummation or the end of this age, they're pretty much all in agreement to the fact that some people are destined to one place and some people will be destined to another, which now brings me back to talk about a designation. This is the difficult part. When we talk about the wheat and the tares, first of all, the, the, the parable is pretty clear, but if we weren't sure, the designation that some people may think, I am wheat, versus those people over there that are tares. Be very careful. This is why I keep repeating these things, because I actually believe they are true. Matthew 7, judge not. You are nobody's judge. You are in no position to declare somebody saved or unsaved. This is why, I, and I will keep repeating this, so I'm sorry if you're tired of hearing this. Your precious little ears are getting tired. But here's the thing. God is not in the business, if you will, of trying to please you or appease you. He has a will that he is going to accomplish, the vessels that he's chosen and that he has called. And the problem is a lot of times we end up, like I heard somebody say years ago, that they, as a child, said the sinner's prayer, they were led by their mother, and they said the sinner's prayer, and I think they were five or six, and because they said the sinner's prayer at five or six, they were saved. Let me ask you something. Does a child at five or six know what being a sinner is? So tell me what that produced. That produces, and I'm not saying that, listen, I'm not saying teaching your children at an early age is bad, but no one can declare you saved or unsaved. This is my pet peeve with most of the evangelists that you see or watch on TV. How many of you have seen this? The close of the program comes, and here it comes. Listen, all you got to do, and you know, let's, let's talk down to you because we don't really think you're that smart. Now, if you think that you need to be saved or you know that you're a sinner, first of all, how can you know you're a sinner? Because most people start off on the premise of sinning is I smoke, I drink, I cuss, I blah, 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 versus the condition I was born in and Living just the state of being, falling short, these people who say, now recite this prayer, and here come the magic words. What do they say? And now you're saved. You ever hear that? You ever see that? Yeah. yeah, okay, come on. I think more of you have seen it than you admit. And it's a tragedy because no one can declare anybody saved except God. So this is when I talk about tares in the church. I, I'm trying to push the envelope as far as I can so that some of us wake up. The privilege of being wheat, this kind of sounds a little wacky, but the privilege of being wheat and being designated as a child of God, well, then that brings the people who say, well, how do you know you're saved? And then we begin this whole circle of frustration. Please don't go there. There's one criteria one criteria, don't make it a thousand, don't make it personal, don't make it emotional. One criteria, if you are reading this book or you're listening to me, is Jesus Christ Lord and Savior? Did he die for your sins and did his finished work on the cross 
take your sins, past, present, and future, to wash and cleanse you, that you trust him, that when it says he came out of the tomb, he came out of the tomb, and because he came out of the tomb and he's the first go of his kind, I shall be like him. That simple faith and trust, that's all. There's nothing else. There's no, well, if you'll jump through hoops, if you'll act like Pavlov's dog, if you'll perform these works, a lot of people are promoting these ideas. I'm here to tell you, don't even go there. So the difference between these two categories, my barn versus you burn. <laughs> okay, pretty simple. And I want you to take a look at one other thing. When it says about who did this, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. That's verse 39. Well, that tells you something that the devil has been sowing for a long, 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 long time. Now, you've heard me say this, but there's, there's nothing more real than when I can, as I said, speak from experience, that I have seen more people who are actually, their behavior, if you will, in my own realm, that are more children of the devil than they could ever be children of God. I'm not, I'm not judging them, but their acts towards the church. These are the people who are sometimes in the church. They will become critical of you. You know, they saw you out this morning, and uh, you were on the street corner smoking a cigarette. <laughs> I, it's my personal preference. I don't know why you'd do that, but that's your business. It's not... If you're going to say that's a sin, then I'm going to sit down with a very heavy individual and say, let's talk about that first before you talk about other things. I mean, don't, don't go measuring stuff here. But the tragedy, and this is the tragedy, you get to the place of seeing how no one will tear you down like someone who actually has been in the church. See, the world, the world will take one shot, they lob off their best shot, and they go away. But it's the ones who've been planted by the wicked one. They're the ones that do the most damage. And that's why I said look to the church first. Look inside the church first. These are the people who will be critical of you when you're not walking the straight and narrow as they are. They'll be critical of you and they'll accuse you of slander and every manner of anything that they can say maliciously against you. Now, does that sound like the voice of Christ? Does that sound like the Spirit of God? Does that sound like the Holy Spirit coming to comfort, to encourage, to build up? Or does it sound like the devil and his minions here to tear you down? You choose. I can tell you because I've seen this with my own eyes. People, out in the, you know, think about it. The church is the only place where you really have this happen on such a large scale that it's mind-boggling to me that people in the church most of the time can't see it. Where do you have either a, you know, a business or an organization, anything that's not the church, okay? If you don't like that business or that organization, you might leave a bad Yelp review. But the first thing you're going to do is you stop frequenting the business and you go somewhere else and you're not talking about it all the time and you're not trying to destroy but you have people that come into the church and their whole goal is if they can't destroy you or get you out of the church or get you to feel like you're a second-class citizen, they'll go to work in the most Christian way. And when I say the most Christian way, I've said this to you, no one, no one can cause injury to you better than a fellow brother or sister because you don't expect it. And these very well can be tears. These are the people that say, you ought to do this, you ought to stop doing that. They're the finger pointers. They're the critical ones. They're the ones that can never be happy. And they have the recipe for being a perfect Christian in a perfect church. I hate to tell you this. No, I don't hate to tell you. It's reality. There is no perfect church. There is the people, imperfect people, who belong to the Lord. But there is no perfect church per se. If you're looking for it here, ain't going to find it. That's why I said to you, find yourself a pastor or a teacher or a minister who you can agree with most of the time. I highly doubt you're going to agree with everybody in your life 100% of the time. That may happen, but it's 
very unusual. Find yourself someone who is opening up the word of God, and it may not be perfectly, but here is the book. It's open. We're talking about it. We're trying to get to the heart of what is being said so we can better understand versus, again, tears. Well, hallelujah, praise God, Jesus saves. Now let's talk about my latest and greatest endeavor. And we're now, we've now left the book, we've left the church, and we're on to worldly things that should somehow get you to say, hell no. But most of the church world has just basically tagged along, which is why the face of the church has changed dramatically. And I'm asking you to kind of consider this parable in that light. You know, if you have been chosen for something as, a part, as opposed to people who haven't been chosen or, or you're part of something that you know is for a greater good or is, is the, the beacon of light in a dark place, you'd think that you would be motivated to, when I say support, I'm not really speaking about financial support, but support universally to help that individual or individuals propagate and perpetuate that which, even though every single minister, including me, flawed, I will make mistakes, I'm human, but you follow someone who is at least opening up the book and don't start shining the light that says, well, if you're not doing it this way, I can't follow you. I love people who can be the biggest hypocrites. They're in the church. They're not outside. They're in the church. Oh, I'm going to do it, you know, because you just got to do it. <laughs> you know, there was a, an individual here who listened to my husband, my late husband, for supposedly 30 years. This is the shock. This is where, and when I say to you, I'm not the only one that has the ability to see this. There's a lot of eyes in front of me that know exactly what I'm talking about. Anybody who listened to my late husband knows one thing. The core and the bulk of his message, faith. Faith, 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 faith. So think of it this way. This one individual I'm referring to, what happened when Dr. Scott died? Zero faith. That, it comes down to that. Zero faith to actually trust God to do the impossible. Zero faith for, for someone who listened for 30 years, be instructed supposedly to parrot back the message. Zero faith. Faith that should have said, I don't care if she's a man, a woman, or an alien. Faith says, if this is where the word of God is going forth, that's where I'm going to be. And to quote Dr. Gene Scott, if a monkey is preaching God's word, like the parking meter, you better put money in it. You better, you better be attentive to what's being said because you may find out that the monkey that you thought was just a ridiculous animal happens to be the vessel that God chose for that particular time or for this particular place versus somebody who has the appearance perhaps of a more godly and religious person but in fact, their behavior and their deeds show that they're nothing but evil. And I say that to you, and say, you say, well, you said not to judge, but wait a minute. What I'm telling you is somebody that would tear down the work of God, that would spend their time trying to destroy, and that's basically what I have confronted with a lot of these people. You're not of God. Don't deceive yourself. What is of God? What is of God? The Bible says, what is born of God cannot sin. And that's not you and me. That's what's placed in us. And that which is placed in us belongs to God is the person of the Holy Spirit who is guiding us, opening our eyes. You're not going to be shaking and rolling on the ground and frothing at the mouth. God's Spirit brings order. God's Spirit brings understanding. God's Spirit helps you to understand and get the mind of Christ. So is it the mind of Christ to tear down people at any cost for your own personal gain? No. So can there be tears in the church? Absolutely. All right. So now let's talk about destination because after all, this is what this, this series of messages is about. 
The difference between, of course, God having the reapers gather them, that is the wheat, into his barn, versus the tares being cast into a furnace of fire. God has prepared, and whether you believe it or not, God has prepared a place for us. This is why I'm going to keep going until I have enough people, the eyes are open, and there's clarity here. God has chosen a place for you and a place for me. Now, I can still, I can still mess up. I do all the time. I'll be the first person to tell you, I mess up a lot. Nobody's perfect. God has prepared a place for me. He doesn't ask me to be perfect. He asks me to trust him. God's pre prepared a place for you. He never said, be perfect. The people that read the King James where it says, be perfect as I am perfect, don't understand that that's English. The Greek doesn't say that. It's talking about completion, coming to a completeness that only God can do in and through you. And the destination becomes pretty important. See, some people have, uh, and I'm, I think I'm going to do this at some point. I will probably separate the camp of all the great theologians because some of them have some really out there ideas, but some have proposed, like taking this scripture and turning a blind eye, that even those people who are tares will somehow be cast into a furnace of fire and then ultimately come out to join the rest of the beloved, and that's just not what the Bible says. So it is important for us to, to, with eyes open, and some of, you have done, some of you have sent me letters already and told me what this series is helping you do. It's helping you read the book with a more eternal perspective. It's helping, and we, we haven't even really gotten into the meat and potatoes of what I want to say, but it's helping to guide our minds a little bit more. And really, at least for me, I'm going to speak for me, it should, for everybody to some degree, whether it's a little or a lot, it should be eye-opening. You know, in, towards the end of the book, it talks about the book of life being opened up. Those whose names were written in the book of life. We're talking about destination, that if God called you, and this is, this is the, the mind-boggling thing, if God called you, you can... I don't believe one saved, always saved. You can still fall off the trail. You can stop trusting. It's like that example of a power cord. You pull the power, there's no energy in it. There's no supply to whatever you're trying to energize. The power cord is your faith, and as long as you stay connected, you'll make it in. And there isn't some degree of like people, oh, I hope I make it in by the skin of my teeth. I've said that before. What the heck does that mean? Do teeth have skin? I don't know. Anyway, uh, but the point here is that there is a difference in destiny. And without really wrapping our minds around that, you can say, this is just fantasy, or you can say, I too will make the trip. And I prefer for each one of us to say the same thing. I too, I cannot deceive myself. I can pretend, I can try and make believe that death is not my lot, but it is for each and every individual. Therefore, if we are paying attention to what's being said, we want to know in this concept of destiny. I want to know that I'm part of the wheat. How do I know that? How do I settle this matter? How do I stop doubts from coming in? Well, I've just told you what the answer is. Christ is formed in your heart by faith. And once we, we begin operating in faith, today's faith will not carry you to tomorrow each day every day, a new faith for each day, a new faith for each challenge of life. But it is day by day, and it's looking unto him, not looking to me, not looking for strength in me. And that's all God asks of me. This is, this is why I get very frustrated, because the, the real fact of the matter is God asks very little of us, and most people spend a lot of time complaining about how much God asks of us. But it's so little in terms of what I have received from him, that I just don't understand people who say, I just can't. I can't go, I can't listen every Sunday. I can't go to church every Sunday. Really? So one, say two hours. There's 168 hours in a week, so you have 166 hours to do whatever you want. 
two hours to devote to learning, not very much to ask. And, and you think that God's going to be like, oh, wow, yeah, that's difficult. Those two hours are really hard. I'm sorry to disturb you. No, 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 don't, don't disturb you. No, no. I don't think so. So the message from this parable helps me to understand something. Again, not all will be saved. That when I say a tear cannot be turned into wheat, do not confuse this with God who can take anything. Let's go back to the potter's house in clay. God can take and mold and fashion to how he wants it. God can plant something that maybe in its inception is not growing very strong and it's not growing to be very great, but give it time and give God time to enter in and work his good and growth will come what appeared to be maybe a tear, but actually was wheat from the beginning. This is why I'm saying to you, these messages should be, we should consider ponder, meditate, pray. Why? Because it is the lot of every individual. You're not going to escape this, neither am I. And as somebody just recently said, this is probably, uh, second to salvation and understanding salvation, this subject is probably the most uh, neglected and most needed in the church. You know why? Because if people actually had a full picture, as I've said, of their ultimate destination and they had clarity, to where they're going and how they're going to get there, we would get rid of a lot of, I just got to call it this, BS, not PS, <laughs> that floats around people's mind, that consumes your time and your energy, and it's not profitable for anything. So, from the Lord's teaching and not anything else, what we glean very simple. There are two camps of people. Remember I told you about two camps of people. The woman with the alabaster box versus Judas. Judas says, why this waste? The woman brings her best and most precious oil and casts it upon Jesus. There are only two types of people. Ananias and Sapphira are the people who cast everything they had at the disciples' feet. There are only two camps of people. People who look and say, I need God because I'm lost. I need to be saved. I need the Lord's help. I need to be enlightened, if you will, because I feel I am not right with God. I've heard that expression before. And understanding that I can grow. I will not become an automatic expert, but I can grow in God's grace, and I can grow in understanding, and I can grow like the rest of the wheat around me and like the rest of the tares. But specifically now I speak of the wheat. I can grow into what God has designed for me. And you know what? This is the other problem. The design that God has for me and the design that God has for you in a generic way is the same. But specifically, how, how I function in my life and how you function in yours towards God, that is unique to you, and it's your responsibility. It's your responsibility to, to cultivate the conversation with God. That's your prayer time. It's your responsibility but if you have to be, again, I go back to, if you have to be coerced, if you have to be driven to that, seems like it's not much of a relationship. You know, what's the difference? Let's go to the secular. What's the difference between a husband and wife who really desire to be a team, a helpmate, partnership, to go through life together versus two people who are constantly at each other's throats? There is no progress being made. There's no forward look. It's in the moment this constant clashing. You're not going to go anywhere. The same thing is true with God's people. So it's imperative for us to understand that. And if you're interested in this, I'll, I'll just tell you, Jesus talks a lot. There is a lot that he says. Some of it is direct, like what I'm reading. Some of it is indirect. And we'll get to, we're going to cover all this. I want to take everything that's in Matthew's gospel. I want to take everything that I can glean out of each gospel and then out of Paul's writing later on to see what we can glean. But right now I want to treat everything, every reference, and analyze how we can understand, because I think the more we analyze each of these concepts that Jesus puts forth, clarity and more clarity and more clarity comes to the point where the goal at the end of this series, and there is a goal, the goal is to have not just more knowledge, but to have certainty, 
clarity, and the biggest one for me. You know, we can spend our time kind of thinking about eternity, and then we vacillate back to where we are right now. But this is why I love what the Bible says. He has placed eternity in their hearts. And if God has placed it in your heart, your vision and your view is looking unto him and looking ahead. Not with sorrow, not with fear, not with lack of understanding, but with great hope. This is the hope that we have. That, as I said, if Jesus came out of the tomb, which he did, and he rose up from the dead, which he did, and this is the promise he gave to us, then I'm claiming that promise. You can do whatever you want, but I'm claiming it for me. You can claim it for you because that's a promise he gave and God is not a man to lie. You get Meet other people who may be dishonest or half-truths, but God doesn't do that. When he says something, it is. When he declares something a fact, it's a fact. So what I want to say is thank God that today we're looking at this with fresh eyes and understanding the importance of recognizing we cannot, we cannot go and remove the tares. It's not our job. Ours is not the responsibility to sift through. And I think a lot of times, by the way, the tares remove themselves, even though this, I'm leaving this a little bit to say, sometimes people cannot stand the light because the Bible says men love darkness more than light because their deeds are evil. They cannot stand the light And the light of God's word and the intensity of God's word makes those who are not of God essentially eventually go away. They can't stay in the light. But they can deceive themselves, and they can deceive themselves into thinking or saying or talking or telling other people that they're following Christ. But to follow Christ is to be in this book, to read, to understand, to grow, and then to come to some conclusion. My conclusion today for this message is this. God, help every person who's listening to me to come to a clear understanding that death is not the end. And if, if somebody says, well, I, I desire to be in heaven. I don't want to go to hell. Well, here's the thing. The starting point is the choice that you make right now. And I'm not sure. This is that slippery slope. I'm not a Calvinist. The, the, the argument between the Calvinist and the Ar- Arminianist is... is how? I'm, I'm not going to argue that. I'm not arguing if it's possible for somebody who has been uh, so completely out of the pale to never lose their position with God. I, I'm not even discussing that. That's free will and all the forms that people want to fight over. I'm only talking about one thing. The decision to trust Christ wholeheartedly and completely versus people that say, I don't believe this and I reject it and, and my Final question is, you you have absolutely nothing to lose by trusting Christ, but everything by not trusting. This is not, my teaching here is not some insurance policy. Do this just to make sure. God's not looking for those people. Remember, it says clearly that there will be people that will come and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do, didn't we cast out demons in your name? This is why I said to you, there are terrors also in the church, not just out in the world. Lord, Lord, didn't we do thus and so in your name? Depart from me. Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons? Depart from me. I never knew you. Which begs us today to make that knowing God. When he says, depart from me, I never knew you. These people didn't take the time. They weren't interested in knowing God. They were only interested in, almost like Simon the sorcerer. How do we work this thing? How do we manipulate? How do we use God's power for our own benefit versus taking God's word, putting it out there, and seeing God's grace and glory at work in turning people's lives around, in opening their eyes, and giving them hope that death is not the terminus and that there is something great that awaits the believer. If I'm not saying just think of it and imagine it. It could be fabulous, but read about it. Study it, and then thank God for it. That he didn't just say, now I'm going to leave you here and you figure it out. Maybe you'll go and maybe you won't. If that's the type of God you want to serve, you can serve him that way. But the type of God that I'm serving says, he says, he chose you. Today, he chose you out from among people he did not choose. That's out of Ephesians. So I would say, be glad and rejoice. This is indeed not just the day the Lord has made, but you are the people of God. 
rejoice and be glad that God reached into the flow of time to pluck you out and put you in the realm of being able to communicate, have communion, understand, grow, and ultimately be with the Lord forever, to rule and reign with him forever. Now, personally for me, what's more appealing? Gather them, gather the weed into my barn, that's God's barn, that's God's place, that's God's established wherever he's decided, versus the people who are gathered up, bundled up, and just tossing the match, or however the fire occurs. I don't know, where'd they get the fire? I don't know. <laughs> so, I want to encourage you. I don't want people leaving here today saying, well, I, I don't know, am I, am I wheat, am I tear? If you're interested in what I'm saying, then it's axiomatic, it's self-evident. Wheat desires, the wheat is going to want to know, the wheat is curious, the wheat is asking questions about how, when, why. The tares, remember, they just grow straight up, they're proud, they think they've established it all, they don't need anything else, like that last church that says, rich, we don't need anything, but keeps growing upwards, I'm even independent of God. Now, I'll tell you, I'm completely dependent on him. Just like the Bible says, without him, you can do nothing. Well, but with him, you can do a lot, as long as it's powered by one thing, faith. It's faith that starts the process. It's faith that takes you all the way. Hopefully, we will keep going on this subject, and we will keep expanding our understanding of what the Lord said on this subject. And until then, hopefully next week, I hope that you're going to think about what I've said and recognize that we have read these parables for so long they can become commonplace. Go back and reread with what I've just laid out, and maybe another dimension of this parable will come to life. I pray so. In Jesus' name, that's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m., if you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.